Hey everybody, this is Colin Murphy and welcome to Colin Podcasting about Real Estate Show 59. Hope you guys are doing great. I am enjoying my transition to living in Madrid, Spain while still investing heavily in the Tampa, Florida market. I'm recording this on August 31st, uh, 2021 and it's been a particularly hectic two months. Our furniture got shipped on the 1st of July. We, we left the US on the 4th of July and it's it's been a chaotic couple of months getting settled ever since with uh, unpacking, getting kids organized in schools, buying cars, all the admin paperwork you gotta do getting settled in my nice new office. So a whole range of distractions where I wasn't able to work anything close to a full time uh, on, on my business, but it was still, the way I have set things up is great. I, I managed to sell six houses in July and August and buy another five houses and put another four land contracts. Um, so very excited about that. It's surprisingly productive July and August. I was expecting it to be the opposite, but turned out to be a very busy one and I've got plenty of work lined up for Q4 and I'm looking forward to rolling my sleeves up and getting stuck in even more once uh, you know school starts properly and, and you know we all have a relatively normal routine again. So, uh, but so far the, the, the move has been great and managing a business uh, remotely has been working better than I expected. I will record a podcast on the nuts and bolts of that sometime this year if anybody's interested in learning more. But other than that, um, the podcast is, is doing great. Thanks for all your support. We do have a great guest. I've been really impressed with the caliber of guests on the show during the last few episodes and today's is no exception. His name is Johnny Wolf and he's the CEO and co-founder of Homeroom Co-Living. It's one of the fastest growing co-living companies in the US. And if you're not familiar with the concept, co-living is where you rent properties by the bedroom instead of by the house. So for example, instead of renting a single family home for $1,500, you rent each of the bedrooms for $600 each and you get you know, generally correspondingly higher revenue, but you have some of the pros of long-term lets in that they're long-term and they're stable, but you have some of the higher revenue that you usually associate with short-term lets. So it's a quite, uh, an interesting hybrid that I think is poised for pretty strong growth in the coming years and uh, Johnny is at the spear tip of it and he's built a great business around it. Um, you know, we have a great chat about his early career in Silicon Valley where he developed some of the necessary skills, his move to Texas and you know how he experimented with the co-living model himself buying several properties and renting them out by the room before setting up. Uh, a business and scaling a business and, and we dig right into that and how it works and how they work with investors to expand and scale and create win-win scenarios talk about the types of demographics who enjoy living with roommates you know typically millennials and general zers talk about the property types and surprisingly it's not just your your typical urban property but there's high demand for this apparently in suburban places and in, in the midwest cities that johnny and his team are active in and just dig into the numbers a little bit, what types of returns you can expect, average prices. So a very interesting investment niche. I'm, I'm certainly looking at studying it in more detail myself and I have a few friends that might be interested in learning more about it as well. So really enjoyed that show. And uh, yeah, let me know what you think. Let's head on over and see what Johnny has to say. Johnny Wolves, how are you doing? And welcome to the show. Hey, Colin, I'm doing great. Uh, glad to be here. All right. Well, thanks for coming on. So tell us a bit about yourself. Where did you grow up? What was your first job? Sure. Yeah, I grew up in um, Northern California, a uh, town outside of Sacramento called Roseville. Mm -hmm. uh, my first job, um, I was a paper boy uh, for, for four years, like junior high and high school. Nice. So I had to get up super early. Um, Good and I've given, I've given up on doing that. So I, I got out of my system when I was young. Well, it's good that you had a work ethic as a young teenager, you know, there's probably not, I don't know how many do nowadays, but that's, that's a good route to developing a work ethic, I guess. Not fun while you're doing it, though. No, uh, yeah, it's, uh, you know, getting up at, getting up that early is, is tough, it's tough. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, there's, you know, the money was nice when you're, when you're like 11 and you have a few hundred dollars a month, it, it feels like you're a king, so <laughs> yeah. So tell me, did you go straight into real estate in your 20s or did you have a different kind of career or life for that in a different industry? Yeah, I went straight in. Um, you know, I I would was a fi in finance and corporate finance in the Silicon Valley. So I worked in finance for technology companies, uh, some technology startups and also in some uh, at banks. 
So in the background, I was investing out of state, you know, right after college, graduated in 2007, bought my first property in Midland, Texas, which is oil town, Texas, Friday mm. night lights kind of area. Mm -hmm. um, in 2008, bought another, bought a bought property with a self manage IRA a couple of years later. Um, yeah, so that was sort of, you know, it wasn't really a core part of what I was doing but for the first 10 years of my career, which is really focused on, on that finance career. That's pretty cool though. Was that, were you buying, was that at the top of the market or after the crash when you bought those first couple of rentals or how did they work out? Yeah, the crash didn't affect, Midland's a different, it's a pretty strange um, economy really based on oil prices. Mm -hmm. um, and so when oil's high, it, it's almost, it's almost disconnected from all of the, I mean, Oil's connected to everything, but the yeah. real estate prices of Midland are almost disconnected from other real estate prices in the sense that if oil's $2 a barrel and the economy's booming, Midland houses are, prices drop. And if oil goes up, then prices go super high because a lot of people will move into the town to do mm. oil work. Mm -hmm. And then they'll move out if like prices go down, they well shut down. So okay. it's an interesting, interesting um, way to invest in real estate. Yeah. Um, it's not the most stable, but it was it was a cool way to start. Yeah, no, I love that you were wetting your feet in real estate a little bit while you had a you know relatively uh, you know a normal day job working in finance for Silicon Valley, which also has its ups and downs, obviously. But where did mm -hmm. when and how did you transition full time into real estate? I read somewhere that you know you had a bad Craigslist experience that, that led to it. Yeah, I, you know, I, when you live in San Francisco, you live with roommates, even when you're like, you're making $150,000 and you're 30 and you're a VP at a bank. It just, no one can have, very few people, like you have to have a household income of three to $400,000 per year to really buy your first house or a tremendous amount of savings in that area. Mm -hmm. So even, you know, CPAs with masters in accounting, you know, that was the girl I dated she lived with roommates. I lived with roommates. My roommate, my current, one of my roommates was a software engineer at LinkedIn. So just that's how everyone, you know, really lives. Um, okay. In the Bay area. So I, um, 2015, I kind of thought, you know, I don't know if I like this economic situation or being kind of like a forever tenant. So mm -hmm. I moved to Austin, Texas and to uh, invest in real estate more actively. So I bought a number of properties starting in 2015 after I moved there. Wow. Um, turn them into roommate houses because that was the way that I had lived and the way I like to live. So I would live in the roommate house. Then I'd go get another one, live in that one. And kind of over time, I accumulated a number of them. I still hold most of those properties in Austin today. Um, and those I kind of see as like my first big real estate investments, but also my first foray into the roommate housing space. Although I had kind of lived in them, you know, for 10 years in San Francisco is the first time I'd actually set up the home and owned it and run it. I love that. So you're kind of house hacking in a way, like you, you get a loan for an owner occupier loan, but you rent mm -hmm. out the rooms. And then when you're eligible to get another owner occupier loan, you moved on to another one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And one of the things that, you know, it is, is lenders will actually give you upgrades in properties relatively quickly. So you don't, you can wait a year if you're just going to buy an even, an even property, mm -hmm. but if you buy a duplex first, Typically, you can go to a lender and say, actually, I want a single family home now. And they'll, they'll make you write a letter of why you want it. You don't have to lie. You can just say, I just want a single family home now. And they'll be like, cool. And so then you can actually, you know, I was able to buy a duplex in Austin and a single family property within the first few months of me moving there kind of really quickly. Um, out of pocket was less than, I think, $20,000 for both. Wow. And were you still working uh, with Silicon Valley at this stage or did you get a, a job somewhere else or were you just? Yeah, I had a, I had a director of finances, a, a startup job. So I, I, I was working, I would say two full-time jobs kind of in real estate and then in, in, the, in that. And um, my first transitioning full, full-time in real estate happened in 2018 when I moved to Kansas City and started Homeroom, which is a company focused really on roommate houses. I love that. So you were a roommate and then you bought houses. So you're, you're basically a tenant in someone else's house, like most of San Francisco, like you say, even people are earning six figure salaries. And then you mm -hmm. move to Texas where you're able to buy some single families or small multifamilies and build a kind of an investment portfolio that way, mm -hmm. gaining more knowledge. And then it sounds like you pivoted again, using that knowledge to basically build a company in, in that space. 
Yeah, um, you know, I learned, uh, I knew some about real estate, but that three years in Austin of buying properties and running them is where I really kind of learned. You learn like, you know, property management is pretty easy with one house, but then when you have multiple, it starts to get a little trickier, you start to have multiple tenants, it starts to get a little trickier. Mm -hmm. um, so I learned real estate and I kind of, because I had that startup experience and that finance experience at some really uh, tremendous companies earlier in my career, mm -hmm. I was able to kind of combine those two concepts when I created Homeroom and kind of when I moved to, in 2018. So I'm always fascinated by, you know, entrepreneurs setting up, uh, you know, trying to set up a disruptive business. I mean, what, tell me about the early days in, in that business. Did you need a lot of funding? to get it up and running what what was difficult you know about the first you know first year or so there um yeah it was it was tremendously difficult um i sold one of my austin properties um and then pulled money out of my retirement to start the company so i didn't get any funding i self-funded it okay for the a bit over about a year and a half um mm -hmm. but yeah the first you know the first you um until you've done it, you don't really know what you're doing. Um, so I, I just because I'd watched some really good entrepreneurs in the Silicon Valley, but I hadn't done it. I'd been the finance guy, um, which is, you know, you're pretty close to the CEO. And I was very, I reported directly to the CEO in, a, mm -hmm. in one of the startups, but I still didn't really <laughs> understand it. So the first, um, the you first year was tough. Not understanding it. If you knew everything in advance, you might not do it because <laughs> it's so hard uh, that's that's very true <laughs> that's very true the first year was pretty brutal you know i tried some interesting approaches i tried to hire an army of craigslisters to like you know we do leasing in person for roommates and we try to rent master lease properties and we try to buy it we bought all the furniture ourselves um and then it you know it was really tough because we weren't growing as fast as i initially thought Mm -hmm. I ended up having a, we had these part-time people that I met on Craigslist that we kind of had like a little team and it was like all oh, pretty exciting for about four months. Then we started to run out of capital. Yeah. Um, so I had to let most of them go and it was just down to me and like one operations manager. Mm -hmm. um, so that was, that was pretty tough, but I mean, we started to figure things out with less pieces of people, less things moving. We started to get processes improved. Things started to work a lot better. Mm -hmm. uh, we started to fine tune things. And then about a year in, you know, the operations manager got a DUI and got, he was gone. Like he, oh, no. he put it. So we were down to just me. So you said, what was the bad part of the first year? That was probably the all time low. So it was just like down to me. And like, I had a couple of contractors and we had hmm. 20 properties and 120 um, roommates. Wow. Um, and so we, you know, starting in early 2020, we just basically, we started from like basically just me and kind of built a team over time today. We're up to about 18 months later, we're up to 70 properties. We have a team of about 10, mm -hmm. um, some really awesome leaders in operations, um, sales, invest, investor focus side. So definitely, um, you know, quite a journey. <laughs> like, I don't think it's, I don't know if it's the worst thing to bottom out and try to and get and get to that point and then push through it. I feels, I think pretty empowering to know that a lot of things that'll happen every day in a business can be bad. But yeah. when I look back and I say, well, it's not me, my only employee didn't get put in, you know, didn't get to do high and is out of the business now. Uh, so everything's going to be okay. So, yeah. Well, I mean, it's, you know, kudos for pushing through the hard times. I think any business owners listening can emphasize with a lot of that, a lot of the craziness that happens in the first couple of years. And it, it never kind of goes away. You're just trading one set of problems for another set of problems. But sure, um, sounds like it's maturing 70 properties with probably what well, I'm guessing several couple of hundred um, roommates or, or whatever you call it. Your yeah, we're, we're between three and 400 now. Um, we're adding about 10 properties a month. We really kind of this last quarter have hit like our stride where, wow. you know, we, we had 10 properties in Q2. We're going to add 25 in Q3, um, ideally 40 in Q4. So really starting to really get moving. Um, and I'm, yeah. I'm curious about the business model. I mean, 10, um, 10 a month, 25. I, you know, is this a mixture of properties your company owns and properties that outside investors own that you act as a kind of master, uh, you know, master property manager on? How does it work? Is it a hybrid or? or we, we actually don't own any properties. I personally own a few, a couple of them. I own 
our first two, actually, I started it. And then, but the company is sort of the middle layer. It's sort of like the Airbnb for the experience. So the owner's on one side, the tenant's on the other, and we're kind of in that middle. So, but we don't current, as a company, don't own any properties. Okay. Okay. But that's, I mean, yeah, I, I like that. I mean, that, that helps a lot with capital, <laughs> to say the least. <laughs> um, so you, no you, you have good relations with, with investors that own the properties and then presumably you have some sort of multi-year agreement where you can earn, earn income and fix them up the way they need to be fixed up for your tenant profile. Yeah, it, we actually partner with the owners to set up the properties. So mm -hmm. we we do a we do an intro pro forma where we say, hey, you know, the benefits to you as the investor is if you would buy a co-living properties, the rent can be seventy percent higher than if it's a single family rental. And we have examples of an, a few houses where it rented for fifteen hundred before co-living, and then after co-living, it rented for twenty seven hundred and combined. So we, you know, there's a big upside for investors and we say, hey, you're actually going to, you as the investor will need to, you know, this is your investment. This is your property. You'll be setting it up. We'll help you furnish it. We'll help you add bedrooms if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, and that will help you yield kind of this uh, way above market cash flow and cap rate. So we're able to get in pretty impressive returns in B neighborhoods um, with very, you know, limited occupancy. Um, our stabilized property occupancy is like in the mid 90 percentile. So fantastic. So is it kind of a, like a turnkey service mm -hmm. you provide to investors? You, you source the property, you uh, you get it, get it fixed up and then you, you, you manage the, the tenants. Yeah. It's pretty close to turnkey. We don't hold inventory. We actually help the investor find and buy the property and then we would do the work for them. Although investors are allowed to like do it themselves. We have a guide. You can do it um, if you'd like. Um, but yeah, we have, you know, um, it's really for the passive investor looking for something that's a better asset level than like mm -hmm. a C or C minus class kind of flip. Um, and then also looking for kind of higher cash flow. Okay, that's very interesting. So it's it sounds like you're getting some of the benefits of the short term lets in terms of the gross income, but with less of those onerous overheads because you're not changing, mm -hmm. uh, you know, bed sheets every five days and all the rest of it. You're, you're there. Yeah, short short term rentals. Contract. Yeah, have you done short term rentals before? Or? Uh, I've dabbled in it and and I've yeah. seen the benefits, but not enough to stick at it. Yeah, I've, I've dabbled in it too. It's it's tough. <laughs> we we like to say that if you think about the three ways of using a single family property, you have short term rentals, you have mid term, you have co living, which is us, then you have uh, standard rental. Is that a short term rental will have the highest possible yield income, mm -hmm. but it will have the lowest stability because mm -hmm. seasonality plays into it. Pandemic hits, you might be hosed. There's other things. There's all this movement. There's also like massive amounts of people are moving towards the short-term rental market so prices i we do i do think over time we're going to come down um and then on the, the single family rental space you have the lowest possible income but middle stability you know it's not super stable but there are big zero dollar months but you can't have nice periods of 12 24 36 months of not having to worry with co-living we think it's the middle income wise but the highest stability, because once you set up a co-living property, there's no zero dollar months at all. Um, it generally stay, it go pretty quickly. It gets to the market average rent for a single family rental. Mm -hmm. And then when it's max occupancy, it's above. And then it may drop on occasion to about the market rent, but that's the lowest you'll get. We actually have no properties that have ever had a zero dollar month or even gone below market rent after they've been set up. For yeah. Co I can see the benefit because if you have a three bedroom house, you basically have three tenants. And if one mm -hmm. of them leaves, you're still earning income from the other two bedrooms. Whereas if you have exactly. a family rented to a family and they move out, then it, you might have six or eight weeks to turn that around and get it occupied again. And yeah. And their kids might have like drawn on the wall with crown. <laughs> so you might um, not even be able to like list it for, um, you know, for, for four weeks. So, so tell me what, what kind of demographic does co-living appeal to? And how, how has it been growing? Yeah, it, it, our average age is 27. Um, uh -huh. We skew slightly male, young, uh, white collar and blue collar, prof, you know, professionals on the way up in their career. Um, you know, everyone's budget conscious with housing, but you know, at that age, especially it, it matters even more. 
Um, we also find that people in that age, they're sort of not, uh, the mar marriage age has really been pushed much, much later. So it's like 35 now. So people mm -hmm. don't really want to live alone for 15, you know, 15 years after college. It's not something that um, is as appealing as people think. A lot of people like the show Friends or the show New Girl because you have like a temporary family in your 20s and 30s, which is like your friends. And so that's a big draw to what our demographic likes as well. They're generally going to prefer community over privacy. So I would say community focused, budget focused, 20 to 40 year olds, essentially. Interesting. And, and so I, I guess, yeah, they, these are, like you mentioned, people postponing marriage, preferring to live with people. These are trends that are accelerating, right? This, this isn't something that's, that's fading. Um, like you said, yeah, there's, getting married there's like later a, just helps with that kind of business model. Yeah, it's, um, yeah, it's definitely, it's getting more and more, it seems to be drawing further and further out. Um, and in addition to that, like the number of people out living with roommates since in 1981 was 11%, and today it's 26%. So the number of people living with roommates continues to be on the rise. And we, it's really a function of that phase of life kind of becoming bigger, right? Mm. People, I think living in an apartment by yourself for two years, you know, be 22 to 24 and then getting married and getting married, living with your significant other is fine. But I don't think people are as interested in doing that for 22 to 34. That's a long time to live in an apartment alone. Yeah, no, I, I can see what you mean. And so... What, what kinds of properties are these? I mean, are they your typical urban properties, close walking distance to, you know, bars and restaurants and, you know, work buildings? I mean, or, or is there suburban demand for this type of stuff as well? Yeah, we see a, a lot of suburban demand. Actually, that's our primary focus is, it? is the suburbs because we find the mix of the price point for investors and the demand is still super strong as the, the best fit for, for an investor. So yeah, there's there's definitely a lot of roommate demand in the in like those hot spots, but um, there's there's the demand for roommate living is actually pretty even throughout the United States. You know, the 20 million are probably denser in the city center, but there it's also very dense everywhere. So we have you know we have houses that are pre-booked in Shawnee, Kansas, or Olathe, Kansas, or these outskirts cities in the Dallas Fort Worth metroplex. So it's it's pretty um, it's pretty uniform the need for for roommate housing. Um, obviously, just like anything, it's more dense in the center of the city, but it's, there's sufficient density out anywhere above with a thousand or more people per square mile. Okay, and are there some markets in the U.S. or some states in the U.S. that you can't currently go into because you know renting by room is is prohibited is that you need to rent by house or is that pretty open nowadays? Um, I don't, there's actually no markets that I'm aware of that don't allow room rentals. Um, okay. It depends on the city. Some cities, de cities define a family as a different amount of unrelated occupants. And so each city has like a different limit on that. Mm -hmm. um, some cities actually don't even have that. And the state of Texas, for example, their max occupancy has nothing to do with if you're related by blood and it's two people per bedroom. Um, is the max. So if you have a five-bedroom house, you could theoretically have 10. A lot of cities have an additional law that says maximum unrelated occupancy is five. For example, that's what Fort Worth has. Okay. So those are things that we're aware of. Um, yeah. And so I guess this just occurred to me, if you're renting out the rooms, does that mean that the property owner needs to buy the living room furniture and, and fit out the kitchen with appliances? Yep. Yes, we do. It's similar to setting up an Airbnb in that respect. Uh, we don't furnish bedrooms because our average stay is a year. And so people bring their own bedroom furniture. Okay. Um, but, in, but you know, we have like, we have a pretty basic package where it's, I think like a flat $6,000 to do all the common area furnishing and the kitchen essentials and then the smart home technology. Um, and that, you know, and that will kind of get you set up. Okay. So you're, you're, you're in charge of, of, you know, internet and utilities and you just kind of bill the, the, the tenants a flat rate of that on top of their rent. Yep. Correct. Nice. Yep. Yeah. It does yeah. have a lot of the pros of Airbnb without the cons, because like you say, they're, they're generally renting it for what, six months, 12 months or, or, or longer. Most of our tenants rent for a year. We have, but we do have tenants that have been with us for, since we started the company three years ago. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
and so yeah i mean what markets are you are you currently in now then where, where do you operate uh kansas city austin dallas and uh san antonio okay and we're looking for a fifth market right now so why if you have any recommendations you... colin i'd love to hear them well yeah maybe <laughs> so why did you choose the the midwest is it because it's more affordable good good rental yields what's what's going on there? i mean i was just i was in kansas city um, when i started the company because i was you know looking to buy more properties for the roommate model i was using for myself mm -hmm. and um i found that it worked and I, and I thought hey a lot of investors as long as i've been on bigger pockets everyone's like kind of wanted to invest in kansas city so maybe there's a way that we can kind of create an opportunity for investors elsewhere to do this so that's kind of just we just started in kansas city because i was here um and then we've expanded since then. We've been, you know, you're trying to balance a couple of things, the demographics of the cities and the growth, um, mm -hmm. and then also the the price point for investors to purchase. Okay. And so what what is your your typical price point? I mean, like you say, these aren't your, you know, when people think of Midwest rentals, they often think of kind of C quality rentals, maybe a multifamily rented out for like 600 a door or something. You, you seem to be with these, you know, they're higher level, they're, you know, they're kitted out with, with internet and, and keyless door entries and nice furniture. I mean, what, what, what kind of price levels are you, are you talking about? Uh, usually 250 to 300 is kind of the, the range. Okay. So for $300,000, what kind of gross income would you expect once it's operational? Something around, yeah. You know, about three thousand. Yeah. Okay, so three thousand a month. You're kind of hitting that one that mythical one percent rule um, to get that, which which is great in 2021 because certainly in the market I know best, Tampa, Florida, you weren't really getting the one percent rule since 2017. You know, um, so that's, no, it's not it's, it. a, it's not a great rule anymore unless you just don't want to buy property anymore. Yeah. So. But I like that if you're getting something and then presumably these are properties that are, like you say, they're fully renovated to, to reasonably high level. Are they typically older buildings? Is it a, a mix of, of properties? Midwest got a lot of older stuff, uh, you know, built in the early 1900s, mid 1900s, or, or is it all, what do you see? Depends on the pro the, the city you buy in. Um, if you buy in, if you buy in the idea of DFW. Um, mm -hmm. We generally don't. We generally tell investors like if you if you want um, the highest returns buying something. We generally are targeting things built in the '60s and '70s, but not specifically because they're built in the '60s and '70s. They just end up the price point. It kind of ends up being the right overlap. Mm -hmm. We have investors that are really interested in newer builds. Um, it's I think there's definitely opportunities for rent to own or built to rent kind of options. But if, if you're not doing it right, you can, you can lose a lot of returns when you buy a newer build, it's going to be more expensive. A lot of times it'll have an HOA fee, which homeowner actually doesn't do HOA neighborhoods. Right. Um, and so we generally say, Hey, you know, you're probably going to make more if you buy something built in the eighties than if you buy something built in 2011, you're going to pay a big premium for that newer build. And, mm -hmm. um, there's frankly just like not any of them out there. So um, yeah. it's hard to, it's hard for me to justify it knowing like the average repair bill we have for like a, a property built in the seventies, mm -hmm. which is frankly not very high. I just can't see how people can make more money by owning a newer property. And I've owned brand new properties. I've owned properties five years old. I mean, what, what's your, I'm actually curious your thoughts on that. Like, I are mean, you a big new build guy or do you prefer? No, I'm not. I mean, or you know, and I own some newer stuff, but for me, everything like kitchens, bathrooms, floors, ACs, roofs, they all depreciate at the same speed, whether your property was built in 2015 or, or 1970. You know, I built a 1970 sure. house, put in a new kitchen, bathroom, roof. It'll depreciate at exactly the same speed as, as a brand new home. I mean, obviously, if you get really old properties, you might be talking about, you know, plumbing, weird. structuring. Yeah, and weird, weird plumbing, tube and knob, electrical. Yeah. yeah. But if you kind of avoid that, like you mentioned, that sweet spot of building, you know, buying stuff that was built in the 70s and 80s, uh, the structure of the house, you know, the plumbing, electric, uh, you know, flooring uh, structure, the walls is generally OK than everything else. Like you say, you pay a huge premium for a new build and you, and you don't get it back 
in uh, in income really uh, you might pay 40 percent more to buy the house and get 20 percent more in rent slightly lower insurance bill um but yeah the yeah, yeah. the numbers don't really pencil and I, I feel like a lot of times when we talk to investors it's like unraveling like I th- a lot of investors uh, in our experience feel like i think they think of a house kind of like a car which it, a car inevitably goes down to being worth zero at a certain point just like it's not you can't yeah. even get you have to pay someone to take it <laughs> yeah you know, at a certain point like even like the charities won't take your car because we're so little um but a, but a house has there's some you know 100 year useful life it, i do think you know property that's 40 to 60 years old when you start to get into the 20s and 30 you know older than the 1920s things start to get you're right pretty weird um you definitely want to avoid if you can avoid cast iron plumbing that's always a nice thing to do um, yeah. for sure but um yeah i just we've done the numbers over and over again and it's just buying stuff in the 60s 70s 80s is better returns right mm-hmm. and you can the resale value in 15 years now the properties are kind of the exact very close in price mm-hmm. you almost accelerate the appreciation almost is nullified by a newer build in a way because it's not going to be new in 15 years okay and are you so is your company responsible for managing the maintenance of all these properties when there's leaky faucets and acs and you know windows that don't work properly or whatever is that you you guys are sending yeah to fix all that and just adding it to mm-hmm. the owner's monthly yeah service. we just we just take it out of rent every month we don't really make we don't make any money on that it's like kind of a break-even thing but mm-hmm. um yeah it's not it's not a tremendous expense for our owners okay and so what's what's your fee of the you know three thousand dollar a month rental what do you take for for managing you know the the tenants in those bedrooms yeah, we have two different options. We have a guaranteed rent option. So you can sign for that. We'll give you a rent guarantee. And no matter what the vacancy is, you'll, you'll receive your rent. That's That'll be about 70% of the max occupancy. So you get a 2,100 rent guarantee. Mm-hmm. Um, so we have is a lot that of the max you get as well? It's just that's the flat. It just rent. It's three years locked in. It doesn't go up. It doesn't move. We have another option where it's 15%. Well, it's an 85-15 revenue share. You get 85% of the rent that we collect. That actually goes up with increases in rent and goes down with vacancy. Mm-hmm. Um, on average, people had, most people choose that option and they, because they make more money because our occupancy is substantially higher than yeah. 85%. What about your placement fee? If somebody vacates a room and you have to place a new person in the room to charge for that? We don't, we don't charge a placement fee. So it's just part of the, the yeah. Okay, that's great. And so if I buy a house, um, how long would it generally take for your... You know, if I wanted to use your services to, to fix it up and put the living room furniture and the internet and keyless entry, how long would that generally take to do? And then how long would it take to have it, you know, all the rooms rented? Yeah, it's very, it's very house by house basis. We also build bedrooms, right? So we have like an extra den or areas that, mm. you know, a finished basement with a door and we'll, we'll build out extra rooms. So depending on the level of construction repairs to do the furnishing and that stuff takes a few days, um, but the construction part can take a little bit longer. Mm-hmm. We try to be done in three weeks total for everything, okay, including a Matterport and turn it to turn uh, deep clean. You know everything's looking ready to go. Um, sometimes it'll go a bit longer though if we're going to build. If sometimes we'll cut out an egress window for a basement to have an extra bedroom, and sure. that can th- that kind of stuff takes a bit longer. So. Okay. And then what about like t- is tenant placement pretty similar to a house? Like three four weeks to you know, have it fully occupied or well, it's maybe pretty, pretty close. Work. We try to do one to two tenants per week uh, once the property's ready to go. And okay. we're, we're, we work on pre-leasing. It's just a lot harder with a, with a property under construction without like a 3D tour and furniture. Like the, it just, the leasing gets much easier after that stuff's ready. So. Okay. No, I, I like the concept a lot. I'm very keen to learn more about it. So do you, do you send out emails to your investor list saying, here's a property we recommend you buy that would make good rental if you're interested mm-hmm. let us know and we'll do you submit offers for people like as a, as a local realtor or yeah we have we have we have realtor partners okay. um, and th- those partners are their local market they've done a number of co-living homes with us our harrison our harrison our um, first guy out of dallas has done like i think three dozen properties with us so they're very familiar with what homes we need mm-hmm. what we're targeting we want 
you know, the right layout. We want enough parking, all this stuff. He, so he'll, he'll submit offers on your behalf, but also kind of like walk you through, like, since he's seen a lot of these purchases, how to think about it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So that's, you know, so you have a partner there. We also have an in-house sales team at Homeroom. Uh, Peter is our, you know, our director of real estate investments. He'll kind of be there throughout the process of purchasing. Our construction team will actually look at your inspection report and give you like a quick video synopsis of what they see, mm -hmm. let you know if, if it's safe to move forward. And then you can ask our construction team if they have any, if you have any other questions. Um, and then on day one, once the property is closed, we kind of get started. We were, we're building a project plan in the background before the property is purchased. Yeah, this so. is great. So, so aside from local realtors keeping a close eye on the MLS for properties that match your criteria, mm -hmm. are there other ways you source properties? Do you do you like target wholesalers or target motivated sellers or do auctions, anything like that? No, we haven't. We've we pretty much. Ex I mean, we have some off off market deals that we stumble across in the markets we're in, mm -hmm. but we currently don't have any off market like deal sourcing kind of strategy in place. Mm. I mean, the, the good thing about your model is with, with the income you generate, you can afford to buy something off the MLS at market rate, right? That's kind of the, the beauty of it. Yeah, uh, we, we're, we're adding value to kind of the normal deal. So then it becomes a great deal versus trying to find a great deal. Um, but obviously, both work great. I, I think um, we, we like this one a, lot, a bit more, though. It's like pretty expensive to you know find off-market deals. Yeah, it's it's a whole other department in your company, really. Um, yeah. So that, how did co-living fare during the pandemic? I mean, every type of real estate owner was kind of panicking, uh, you know, in, in Q1 or Q2 2020 saying, am I the asset category that's going to go down or, or not? I mean, how was how was co-living? I mean, I we definitely panicked uh, just like that. <laughs> so <laughs> it was a dark, it was a dark, you know, dark uh the beginning was, I think, the hardest uh, mm -hmm. mentally uh, yeah. for most people. Um, yeah, we we did we actually did well though. Um, we had put in place a remote leasing, which meant we did video calls with tenants. Okay. Uh, we had smart locks on the doors, and we had virtual tours. So we would actually we didn't actually go in person to do leasing. Mm -hmm. um, we we changed that in like spring of 2019. So we had about a year of remote leasing in place at that point. So when COVID hit, we actually continued remote leasing was pretty, it was working really well. Hmm. And so we, we, we went down to zero vacancy. We kind of slowed our growth a bit. Sure. And we just like had a waiting list and we built a COVID protocol first two or three months. And then after that, we said, oh, it seems like, you know, this, we should keep moving this forward. So we started to grow again. So and. Mm -hmm. We started to grow in Kansas City. We um, expanded Dallas in September of 2020, um, very successfully, and and then Austin and and just uh, two months ago. So mm -hmm. yeah, it's been um, some co-living companies did struggle tremendously. A couple went out of business. Mm -hmm. um, a couple lost a lot of money. We we actually we did better. Um, you know, some of it's luck, some of it's just kind of we had put processes in place that happened to be really helpful in that situation. Yeah, well, and I guess some of the, your competitors might actually own that and might be highly leveraged and might have high, you know, loan repayments every month. Whereas, like you say, if, if your occupancy dips, it's not necessarily catastrophic for you. I mean, you just work hard to get them full again, but you're not on the hook for tens of thousands of dollars of mortgage payments every month. Yeah, no, no it's, it's nice to, to be asset light for sure. Mm -hmm. and, and so what's, what's your you know what's what's your kind of future plans expanding is is you know, how how big do you want to grow this in the next couple of years are you still planning to to stay asset light and just become as like airb just become as big as possible in terms of your number of doors on your platform and the numbers of properties you manage yeah we'd like to go we like to go nationwide um uh, hopefully expand further than that uh you know north america and then global would be you know definitely in something we're looking at uh, very, very long term. Um, but yeah, that's, um, you know, we have to kind of get <laughs> into our fifth market before we really start, you know, thinking about that stuff. Yeah, well, it sounds like you're building some great momentum. And I haven't asked this question in a couple of episodes, but what's what's your take on, on the current real estate market? Are you 
you see prices and, and demand continuing to rise, like for example, in, in 2022 and beyond, or are you being more choosy about which markets you're, you're encouraging investors to buy in now? Um, yeah, I think, you know, one of the things we like to show investors a chart of Kansas City real estate, and it's actually only gone down for one period in like the his of the last 50 years. And that was between 2017 and two, or sorry, 2007, 2009, mm -hmm. it went down 10%. Okay. But then 48 year, the other 48 years during the dot com, all these other recessions, like real estate may have gone flat, but it didn't go down. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a little bit of a, some recency bias that people think like, well, the real estate markets like the stock market because we just had a big crash in 2007. I, it's historically, that's not the way real estate behaves. And it just mm -hmm. has almost never behaved like the stock market. It seems to slow down its growth. Um, it may go down 2%, 3%, but it doesn't, we don't see crashes. We don't see erratic behavior like that. So um, I'm a pretty firm believer that you buy great assets in great cities and over time it, 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 it um, will perform. And I feel that way about the stock market, but I feel about, I, but the stock market, there is a temptation to time it because it does go up and down with regularity on a daily basis. With real estate, it just doesn't. Like, so if you buy today, it'll be cheaper to buy a property than if you buy it in a year. And then if you buy it in five years, cheaper than if you buy it in five years. Um, so I highly recommend people buy as soon as they can, because I don't, the, the, wor the worst case scenario is that it goes flat for 18 months you mm. know, at some point, but it's not gonna, you're still gonna be protected from, a, you know, and you're, you're gonna be in a good asset. Um, but I don't, I don't see any kind of risk, you know, price decreases on the horizon, yeah. especially in the, the middle of America. But yeah, I was gonna say that, especially in the Midwest has traditionally been a you know, very much a stable, slow, steady market that doesn't have the same volatility as a Florida or a Nevada or a California where you have had multiple ups and downs in the last 40 years. Yeah, I mean, Las Vegas is like a little different, right? Las Vegas is a little wild. Midland is a little wild. But I guess Austin hasn't gone down in 35 years, right? Mm -hmm. So um, I, I there's agree no... If you buy something yeah. in Austin, a co-living uh, house in Austin or Kansas City or somewhere like that, where, where the numbers make sense on day one and your plan is to own it long term, there's not much point in losing any any sleep over whatever volatility, which is probably going to be low, uh, comes your way. I mean, if you own it long enough, you got yeah. your reserves in place, you got a good good manager looking after it, um, your, your, your chances are going to be much better off than if you'd have just done nothing with that money, you know? Agreed. I mean, and, and to your point, there are there are definitely volatile markets out there um, that have questionable, um, you know, job data growth, you know, population growth data. I mean, Las Vegas is like the quintessential. <laughs> it's sure. just, and so, uh, you know, the underlying economics of the, the city are just very, I think, a little shaky. And mm -hmm. so you just see these wild swings that basically are just consumer investor driven and if it's an investor-driven asset, it's going to have the volatility. But if it's a an owner-driven asset, which is most of the Midwest property, there's not enough investor density to cause volatility. So, yeah, and especially to have that diverse employment base, they're not dependent on you know hotels or conventions or casinos. So you've got a very diverse white collar, blue collar local economy mm -hmm. where no one sector is probably above twelve percent. So that provides Tampa, Florida is got that benefit as well and that mm -hmm. is, is generally you know stress-free way to own real estate long term is to buy in those places that aren't too dependent on any one sector especially an investor driven one or a tourism driven one because that stuff is more fickle 100 percent. okay but I, I gotta say i love i love your business model i know some people that would be interested in in learning more about it it does seem genuinely more passive and more profitable than owning a regular single family home or, or multi-family home. So I think it's, yeah, I'm impressed with your growth, you know, kudos to you. And um, Thanks, if somebody Colin. wants to, to learn more about your business or about you personally, Johnny, how do they, how do they find it? Yeah. So you can find us at livehomeroom.com and my email is johnny at livehomeroom. 
happy to answer any questions about roommate housing or co-living or house hacking um, or starting a company in the Midwest and any of that stuff, any of those things. So, yeah, but thanks so much for having me, Colin. Really appreciate it. No, it's been a pleasure. Thanks again for your time and uh, good, good luck with the future. Look forward to seeing how you keep growing. Thanks, man. Take, yeah. All right, you take care. Bye. Take care. See you. So there you have it, folks. That was Johnny Wolf, CEO and founder of Homeroom Co-Living. I hope you enjoyed that interview. I think that's a fascinating concept that is sure to be growing a lot in the coming years. I love the idea of renting a house per room to maximize revenue, especially if you have a dedicated technology savvy specialist who can kind of manage that kind of turnkey process for you. You know, I've never been a big fan of, of managing Airbnbs or anything like that just because of the amount of, of resources and work and the fickleness of the revenue. But I do really like the idea of, of, of buying properties and then renting them out per room. Like if one room is vacant for a month or so, you still have all the other rooms generating revenue, a little bit like a you know a triplex or a duplex, I guess. So I like the concept a lot. Um, I'm going to dig into those numbers in, in, in more detail, uh, but I suspect uh, strongly that that's the real deal and, and you can earn some very good passive income in, in these Midwest cities. These are all cities that I already liked. I'm already investing in some of these cities myself. I own rentals in, in Midwest cities, so I'm, I'm a fan of that already, so I have no problem uh, you know, dabbling in a little bit of coal co-living uh, properties as well and uh, yeah gotta you gotta take your hat off to anybody that builds uh, a new business that you know disrupts a particular market or, or, or tries to exploit a new niche it's so much more difficult than just buying and selling a house i mean what i do is relatively straightforward buy a house get kitchens and floors and roofs fixed up sell it on to a local family or, or keep it as a rental it's 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 pretty straightforward, but kind of setting up a business with a team of people and, and, and growing it and, and getting customers, getting your buyers and your sellers and managing your processes, it's, it's, a, it's a mountain of work. And, um, you know, a lot of them fail and, and the ones that make it, they, they earn. They earn those millions. I mean, they, they really deserve it. So hats off to Johnny for making that work. And thanks to him for sharing an hour of his time with me. We had a good 20 minute conversation after the interview ended as just picking his brain more and more as I, as I often do when you get these guys on on the phone or on a video zoom call you you know you, you ask them what you want to ask them because you don't you don't get to chat with them uh, you know virtually face to face all that often so to speak so yeah very happy I made that connection with Johnny and we'll be staying in touch with each other and, and sharing some thoughts with each other and how we how we might work together who knows but uh, yeah, thanks for tuning in. I hope you're enjoying these guests. Please do leave me a rating or a review if you haven't done so. Uh, if you see some of these episodes on your social media, I'd be very grateful if you could share that with your own friends. Uh, if you think they might like it, that's a great way of getting the word, word out there. And uh, yeah, I'll be back soon with uh, show 60. But until then, this is Colin G. Murphy signing out. Thanks again, guys. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.